Britain's weather is out of control and the railway is in crisis. Stop the train! Stop the train! There's a lot of people working some very long days and having some very bad shifts. There's damage to the infrastructure on an unprecedented scale. And nowhere is suffering more than the Great Western Network. This iconic railway travels through some of the most challenging and exposed landscapes of the South and West. And at Dawlish Station in Devon, where the main line runs just metres from the sea, debris has been thrown onto the tracks from last night's storm, and the line is temporarily closed. This vital stretch of track that connects the main line between Exeter and Plymouth is used by over 10,000 people a day, and each hour it's shut has a huge impact on the region's economy. Some number of weather stations on the cliff face themselves predict what the likely damage is going to be when there's any weather. So it's usually like green, yellow, red warnings. So you know if it's yellow or red, you might be in some problems. Uh, we've never actually had a black warning before out of that equipment, so we're not quite sure what it means other than uh, the prognosis for a train service on Wednesday really isn't good. <laughs> it seems that Steve's hope of clearing the line in 24 hours was wishful thinking. We've never known it declare a black day. So uh, for all the weather we've had over the years, tonight could potentially be the worst one we've ever had. At network control, the team are frantically putting a plan together to get passengers around the blocked line. Part of the thrill of the job is that you don't really know what every day is going to bring, you know, and, you know, the shift's only as good as the next phone call is. For Dave, it's a logistical nightmare, compounded by engineering works that have closed another section of track nearby. It's already meant that the train service is, is altered, it's thinned out because there's less trains than there are normally. And when you've already got a minimal train service, um, you can't really cut any more out of it without getting yourself into major grief, and that's kind of the situation we're at now, really. As evening falls at Dawlish, a constant barrage of 30-foot waves are pounding the sea wall. Worst storms of this winter have been battering Devon overnight, and there are warnings of further extreme weather to come, and there's been further damage to the railway. It's morning, and Dawlish Station has taken a brutal pounding overnight. I'm just about to gather the team. Um, we are now going to go out and inspect. That's the basics, and that's how it goes during the day. Until Steve's made an assessment of the track condition, the main line from London to Penzance is effectively cut in half. And at Paddington Station, the network's London terminus, passengers are already feeling the effects. Steve and the engineers have arrived at the site of the main damage and are being briefed by the police on how to proceed. And follow the road. And then you'll see the main devastation. Okay. We just want to see from here. The, we won't go any further. Yeah, you, you guys know what you're doing. Yes, so, yeah. not a problem. What greets them is devastation on a scale no one could have imagined. All the substructure for the railway has gone out to sea, as has the sea defence, and the rails are just dangling in the air. And the guy who found it last night actually had his car parked in front of that house. And he didn't think it looked too safe, so he removed his car. And when he came back, the road had gone. The storm has destroyed an 80-metre section of the main line, the worst damage in the network's nearly 200-year history. 1.5 million people living in the southwest are now without a rail link to the rest of the country. And rail engineers are facing the biggest challenge of their careers. Back down the main line in Dawlish, engineer Steve and his team are trying to assess the damage caused by the violent storm. Just supported underneath we stand here. No, guys, it ain't supported. Come on back. There's a hole under here, so don't go any further. And by now, they're in the spotlight of the nation's media. It can be a high-pressure situation. Everyone wants a time scale off you, everyone wants plans off you straight away, and we just need to get together and then get a coherent plan. And that's what we're doing right now. 
This stretch of track, designed by Brunel, has withstood the pounding of the sea since 1847. Although there have been other breaches, this is by far the worst. With the tide still too high to inspect the hole, Steve and his engineers are walking the track to see just what they're up against. The force of the water, the thickness of the brick, it must be like a 40-ton truck travelling at 60 miles an hour to actually do the wall like that and consistently bombard it to make it happen like that for three or 400 yards. A huge amount of force. Never seen it before look like this. It's amazing. The tide's now low enough to gain access to the hole itself. And I'll tell you what, all that section of parapet there is all fractured throughout. One more good wave. And it'll go. go over. Yeah? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, yes. right away. The structural engineer has assessed the situation. And this parapet wall for about 88 metres is likely to um, just fall over towards the sea at any stage. Um, in which case, when it does, 88 metres of track will go as well. We've got some more winds coming, there's some more tides, but it won't take much, apparently, to make it go, so uh, it's going to look worse before it gets better. The situation is so serious, Mark Kahn, CEO of Network Rail, has arrived. Responsible for the infrastructure of the entire UK railway, he needs to find out from Steve just exactly where they stand. It takes some weeks to Yeah, this is going to take some weeks to do. Having seen it more, we're looking at most probably the earliest six weeks, we think, at the moment. Six weeks. But dark clouds on the horizon could scupper their plans. The initial weather forecast for the weekend is they said, if we think it, we had it bad last night, it's getting worse at the weekend. We might put in few five cubic metres of stuff, and three cubic metres get washed away. It might get destroyed as quick as we put it back. That's, that's the biggest concern. Yeah. It's an enormous task for Steve and his team. They must rebuild 80 metres of railway against the elements and against the clock. And what's more, other parts of the network are now under threat. 190 flood warnings are now in place across the if UK. You're traveling Trudy there's problems from First Great Western, with delays between Taunton and Castle Carey due to the floods. In spite of the constantly changing situation, platform staff and passengers from Penzance to Paddington are soldiering on. We've got a coach going direct to Taunton, actually. So if you want to... Where's the best? It's six and one and a half dozen others, to be brutally honest with you. Where are you guys off to? Oh, we're going to Paddington. There's 23 of us. 23, right, OK. Yeah, head down there for a minute, and I'll work out the best route for you. This is absolutely stressful. <laughs> it makes the trip so much harder, and everyone is incredibly flustered when you have to take the bus, yeah. It's worse than confusing, uh, because things change literally in 24 hours. So you go on the website and you think that you're going to get a train and then you find that the line is closed. I, I asked in the uh, ticket office there and the, uh, the guy just sort of put his hands up and said it's a, it's a total disaster, we don't know what's going on, so, you know, my apologies. Well, I live not far from the levels and not far from Dawlish. I'm in between the two, but I thought I'd chance coming to London today. They can run one train an hour across the, the levels. Hot luck if you get that train or you get on a coach. Parts of the track were flooded at Newbury, at Hungerford, Castle Carey. And of course, there's been more since, so um, this gets worse and worse, and there's no end in sight. We still so. go, because it'll be an adventure, even if we do have to get a bus. Yeah. But we hate buses. But we're going to get in a bus anyway, and we're getting a bus back. Sad times. <laughs> but we've got plenty of booze to see us through the horrific journey. We're into some real hard territory here. We're looking at potentially up to four or five hundred train alterations here. It's going to be quite a hard push to get it out as quickly as possible. It's going to be sure. At Dawlish, it's low tide, giving Steve and his team a chance to tackle some crucial repair work to the railway track. We need it on the ground. That way, if it's on the ground, nothing's going to fly off. We can have people walking around. It's not going to land on them. Once it's on the ground, it's safe. We'll leave it there, and the railway structure will be built on top of all of that. And if someone wants to, in 200 years' time, come and dig it up and find some rails, well, that's what he'll find. 
These steel tracks are designed to withstand the constant pounding of 400 ton trains overhead. To cut them, Steve's brought along a specialist piece of kit. It's like jaws. It's hydraulically operated, and it literally goes in and grabs and snaps the rail. But it's now a race to get the track cut before the tide comes in. Hey. Thanks, well done, mate. With the track made safe, local resident Julie, whose house was most badly damaged, has returned to try and salvage some of her possessions. We saw the wall disappear, and then we noticed that the, the, the waves was eating the tarmac and just coming closer and closer to us, and that was it. Then we decided we had to uh, get out. Devastating, because, you know, you don't think that it's going to happen to you. We'll do what we can for you to see if we can retrieve as much as we possibly can before another bout of bad weather comes and takes it away. Right, OK. OK. Oh, look, they're bringing out me bikes. Oh, bless you. Oh, oh, it's just lovely that they care and it's not just about the, the train line. It's a good start, but there are many more challenges that lie ahead. The weather is turning bad again for us. My biggest fear is with the tide and the strong winds that the waves are going to be up against these houses again. That's one of those six-hour periods where we stand everything down, walk away, let nature do its course, whatever it's going to do to the railway, we come back, lick our wounds and crack on. Network Rail says the storm which hit the southwest on Friday could delay repairs to the damaged line at Dawlish by up to two weeks. It says it hopes to have the line open again by Easter. Business leaders say if it isn't open in time, it could be catastrophic for the region's economy. Our South Devon reporter John Ayres is in Dawlish for us this lunchtime. John. Yeah, so when the seawall was initially damaged almost two weeks ago, Network Rail was saying at the time that it would take six weeks to repair it. But that, of course, was conditional on the weather. Well, it hasn't been great. We had the storm on Friday. What Network Rail had done was they'd got some shipping containers, they'd filled them uh, with rubble, and that was used to protect the damaged sea wall. But, of course, along came the storm on Friday, and that has caused further damage to those containers. And so now Network Rail is saying, at the moment, it's going to be an additional two weeks before this line is fixed and reopened. But they'll, by the end of this week, they'll have a much better idea of the exact time and how long it will take. But, of course, having this line closed, having the wall damaged. It's affecting residents who've been evacuated from their homes, but it's also going to have a big impact on the local economy and especially tourism as we go up towards Easter. Since then, nearly 5,000 tonnes of concrete and 150 tonnes of steel have been used. A team of more than 300 engineers have been working around the clock to get the line open again on the 4th of April before the Easter holidays. Meanwhile, as that work continues, many families still don't know if or when they'll be allowed home. Twelve households are still living in temporary accommodation. Although work at Dawlish is progressing well, things don't look so good for Shane Manning. He doesn't know if he'll ever be able to return home and can only get to his house via this special walkway. One of the family cars is trapped on site. Peter Large is one of the lucky ones. He's back home. But he's worried about the future. He says the seawall is weaker here because back when the line was built, Brunel had to make a concession to a local landowner. The wall had to be made considerably lower, as the owner of the house didn't want to be overlooked. This is the Achilles heel. Whatever you do elsewhere in the line uh, is not going to be sustainable unless you deal with what is crucially uh, the weak point. If this engineering work is done to the right specification, um, no, I'm, I'm not worried. I'm happy to, to live the rest of my life here with no intention of moving. Network Rail says it's aware of the weakness, but its priority is to get the line open and look at its resilience as a whole. Our business correspondent Neil Gallagher is with me now. So what have you seen, Neil? 
It's a network rail briefing document. It doesn't actually specify whether what they're thinking about is a secondary backup line that would uh, supplement the main line at Dawlish or whether they actually are thinking about a line which might one day replace it. Anyway, let's have a look at the map. We can show you firstly the passenger routes as we know them today. Now, network rail's first option is to reinstate the Oakhampton line uh, going up past Meldon and then into Exeter on today's freight line. Option two is the Teen Valley route going north of Newton Abbott, basically rejoining um, from the freight line at Heathfield to the freight line at Alfington near Exeter. And the other options are really variations on one theme. So from Newton Abbott, you'd go behind Tynmouth and then pass either closer or less close to Dawlish itself, depending on which they chose. There's an Exminster route, there's a Powderham route and a Dawlish Warren route. Um, Network Rail admit that those southeasterly options would involve new tunnels, but they say at least they would give you enough capacity that you could replace the service that we've got on the main line at the moment. So are these now the options that they're beginning to study in real detail? Uh, yes, that's right. And there may be other options that are put on the table. They say they will listen to any sensible option that is now put forward. Um, there's one option that they don't rule out, which is simply to make the coastal stretch more resilient. Although I think if they did that, uh, nobody would be happy apart from the people at Dawlish. And I think um, the danger here is that if different Southwest communities lobby hard for their own preferred option, it increases the chance that a government might one day decide to save several hundred million pounds and simply uh, just rely on the main line at Dawlish. Meanwhile, the operation to repair the southwest's main rail line at Dawlish is ahead of schedule, Spotlight has been told. Network Rail says good weather and 24-hour working have helped them make up a couple of days and they're now very confident of the line reopening in the week before Easter. The breach in the seawall and severing of the rail line at Dawlish has been nicknamed the hole by engineers. Now they're working to repair it. And there's good news. Network Rail say they're a couple of days ahead of schedule and on course to reopen the line in the week before Easter. We are slightly ahead of programme as we speak. All we can say at the moment is um, we are doing all we can. Every day we're working 24 hours. Uh, as long as weather and the tides allow us, we're doing all we can. There are also more than 30 landslips where earth and rocks have to be removed from the line and the cliffs shored up. But the weather has been kind, which has allowed Network Rail to work 24 hours a day and get ahead of schedule. Very pleased indeed. Uh, it's very nice to hear that uh, they're ahead of schedule because that takes us definitely back before Easter. If they were a few days behind, that would take us to after Easter and uh, I think there would be a lot of very sad faces in Dawlish. But a couple of days before Easter is very good news indeed. Rail workers on the Great Western Network are battling disruption on all fronts. Recent floods, landslides and storm damage means that much of the network is cut off. Engineers must quickly make an overall inspection of the worst affected areas. The only option is to take to the air. The man on board today is John, who with camera in hand, is in charge of the airborne reconnaissance. We've got a number of sites that we want to look at today to see how many locations we've got underwater and are at risk. I have a look at the line between Bridgewater and Taunton um, with a view to trying to assess the damage to the signaling equipment so we can make plans. Uh, this a bit here, Chris, just, just down there where the road's flooded, just check our loads are OK. What I do is um, I sort of guide Chris into the areas that I want to focus on and then Chris, uh, he takes lots of high resolution images for me. But the best way I can describe it is a sort of a Google Street view for the railway. It's completely impossible to access by road. Pretty hazardous, if not impossible, by foot. We also wouldn't be able to get any form of rail machinery out there because it's flooded. Meanwhile, down at track level in Somerset, there's one access point available and a detailed inspection must be made of the flooded rails. Absolutely amazing and horrifying at the same time. Braving the elements today are Neil and his team of engineers who are assessing the structural damage of a vital part of the network. This water's come in so quickly. A week ago, the water was in the fields, but it hadn't built up to here. What we've got here, isn't it? We've got no ballast shoulder, Andy, now. This is incredible how it's eroded the shoulder like that. What we don't know, though, is what damage has happened underneath no. him, obviously. No. 
And these signalling cabinets contain uh, sensitive signalling equipment. These obviously have been underwater and still underwater, so they cannot be relied on. So when the water does recede, we're going to have a big job on our hands of basically taking all the signalling system apart and rebuilding it. We reckon this water out there is at least eight feet deep because the top of the railway fence, which is four or five foot high, is completely disappeared. Hi, Steve. I'm just phoning up just to report in and just to say that the water now is, uh, is, ex is, ex is ex extended by another 200 yards back towards Taunton. The only, the only way through this section now will, will be with a boat. For Dawlish, we sort of understand the tidal conditions and they can work around the tidal conditions. Unfortunately, the difference of this site is it's a waiting game now. There's nothing we can really do now until the water starts to subside. Pioneer Brunel designed his railway to glide through the landscape. In Taunton, Somerset, that meant building the White Ball Tunnel. This iconic structure was the site of the first recorded speed of 100 miles per hour. Nearly two centuries on, it's in need of some vital repairs. The tunnel is a brick arch tunnel and it's been deteriorating because it was put in in 1844 and recently because of all the water in the tunnel it's led to the brickwork to deteriorate and there's now a risk that the brickwork could fall onto the track. Project manager Rosie is overseeing the essential repairs for Network Rail. Right now we're in the last week of our 23 day blockade to apply concrete to the arch of the tunnel so we go in and we apply a concrete lining around the ram arch and then that can remain in place for sort of 120 years. So whilst this 23 days is disruptive to people, it is, it's key to allow us to put in this concrete and safeguard the condition of the tunnel for the future. The tunnel was originally hand-built by 1,000 men over three years. But this £15 million restoration project is now using cutting-edge technology to make the repairs. One of the key bits of kit that we've got to undertake this work is um, we've got a robotic arm that sprays the concrete on, which is mounted onto a road rail vehicle. It's a, an innovative way of doing things. We don't have to have people working at height. We don't have to have people physically doing the spraying, having to deal with sort of issues of vibration, of repetitive tasks. That allows us to undertake the works in the tunnel without having to put people at risk. Whilst repairs are underway, Lera, one of the main HST depots, is on the wrong side of the breach in Plymouth, which leaves many of the workhorses of the fleet unable to be serviced. But engineering teams have come up with an ingenious solution. In an unprecedented operation, costing hundreds of thousands of pounds, trains are now being loaded onto trucks and driven to and from Plymouth by rope. We get to stop the traffic. How much fun is that? Yeah. This is the main route into Plymouth, so very, very busy. I think once they see the train starting to appear on the road, the, the traffic stops. Probably fine that people see this on a regular basis now, so here's the next arrival. Look. From Lyra up to Old Oak Common in London, it takes me with this sort of wait on about, you've got to give yourself eight hours, and that's on, that's on a good run. The Old Oak Common Depot in London is the only other place on the network with the space to get the train back onto the track. You can't rush it or anything like that, you've got to just go nice and steady. No more than 40 mile an hour, it's far too heavy to be going at, at, at any, any more than that. Just making 10 mile an hour up this hill. Even once the train's back in service, it's not plain sailing. With much of the network still affected by floods, it's a challenge for drivers like John. Somerset levels in general is right by the railway line, so you see it. But I've never known, and I don't think anybody in perhaps even living memory has known it flood to the extent that it has between Bridgewater and just short of Taunton. All these lakes are actually fields, but not at the moment. Because of the disruption, which is changing almost daily, you just don't know what you're going to be doing next. But it's not just people that travel by rail. Each year across the UK, freight trains transport over 100 million tonnes of material, including coal, oil and timber, worth 30 billion pounds. A thousand tonnes of timber bound for a wood yard in Wrexham has been stuck for weeks south of the breach. In order to get this timber back on the rails, we've come to Exeter Riverside where 
We've cleared a lot of our ballast to create space for the timber. We have to bring the timber in a few lorry loads at a time. We have to put it on the ground and go back and get more. Today, Tim's team has been loading the wood into a fleet of lorries and bringing it to this freight yard in Exeter. It will take a staggering 64 lorry loads to fill the carriages of the awaiting freight train. And now, this 700 ton load of freight will be pulled by a 1970s class 56 locomotive. They were built basically as a heavy freight locomotive. And at the controls today is driver John. They are good engines, they've got a lot of power, and they're still doing a grand job, considering that we've got some heavy banks to climb, so the old gals do a lot of work. At Dawlish in Devon, a 100-metre section of the main line has been destroyed in a violent storm, severing the South West's rail link to the rest of the country. A 300-strong orange army of engineers are being pushed to their limits, working 24 hours a day in all weathers. The pressure is on to restore the railway in record time. It's a massive responsibility. It's long hours, very hard work. Not everything is going right, but what we do, we find out what's gone wrong, we fix it. Project manager Tom is responsible for the whole repair. And with only two weeks to go before the line reopens, he's meeting his team for a progress update. All the precast sections have been landed front and back and bolted into place. Yeah. Uh, the train's just arrived at the far end of the hole this afternoon, and we're in the process of starting to backfill with the ballast. Is that a 10 unit? That's a 10 unit train oh, okay, at the far yeah. end. Uh, we're literally just filling up one small hole at the far end there on the drainage connection. Is this the final pump then now? This is the final pump, yeah. We're, we're on the final pause now. We'll be, by tomorrow morning, we'll be finished. Sound well done, looks good. But the reopening of the line could be under threat. A crack has appeared in the sandstone cliffs two miles down the line from Dawlish. The cliff face is threatening to give way and engulf the tracks. Tom and the team need to find a solution. This is one of the critical areas of concern. It is a big challenge. We're now basically trying to induce the landslip down onto the railway and then put all that slip material into the sea so we've got a safe, stable slope ready for the first train. With time against them, Tom's called in the help of specialist fire crews to try to blast off as much material as possible. Adding a lot of water to it increases the weight of the soil, try and give it a bit of a shock in a way. So it's a bit like an avalanche, so we can get long reach excavators in to start getting material down onto the beach. And they're using a specialised remote control camera to relay live images of the cliff face. get to the top by the, uh, the tension crack at the back. Our little helicopter drones have been brilliant to allow us to get really good quality pictures and videos close up to the landslip. It's not safe to get people on the surface right in the middle, even on ropes. Coming straight out to this, you can see the railway line and keeping that top line. And... When we started pumping, we literally had two six-inch pumps coming across the top, yeah. and that, the water was flying down those gullies. So it you know, might be a bit of pumped water forming it, the plan seems to be working, but now they have only two weeks to excavate and clear up 25,000 tonnes of soil and rubble. Back down the track at Dawlish, 700 metres of ballast washed away in the storms is being relayed. And this time, they're taking no chances. What we discovered on those storms in February, that there was a tremendous amount of ballast that was washed over onto the roadway, damaged a lot of vehicles, etc. So um, we are currently bonding all the ballast. So all the ballast will be, once it's finished, will be all glued and secured. Just give you an example here now. If you see this um, portion here, hasn't been glued, and that's how loose it normally is. This bit has. You can't move it. The salt water that comes across here it still allows it to percolate down through, but it won't wash it out. Project manager Tom has to make sure each section is finished and clear of debris. We've got to hand back this, not just for trains, but all the local maintenance guys to come in and actually work around this area. So bits of scrap rail and things like that, it's something we really should do all we can to get them out of the way so it's safe for people working at night. But there is one area of concern. For weeks, specialist teams have been blasting 25,000 tonnes of loose material off the cliff face above the main line to prevent it from engulfing the tracks. The engineers have erected a safety fence at the bottom of the cliff. Until this is finished, Tom cannot let the track open. What we've got 
is a camera going on a great big pole over there, which will pick up any movement, any major movement. We've got this thing called tilt meters on every single column. And what they do is they set up an alarm if they, the fence starts moving, you know, when there's no one here. There's going to be a little bit of movement. I can you know, even see a little bit of soil coming down. It's going to happen, that. That's what this fence is for. The big risk, really, is your boulders. It's your big lumps of rock. And there are one or two locations, but we've done all we can to uh, dig around them. But that's what this fence is for. As the landslip team works towards the deadline, the rest head back to base, checking and clearing the track as they go. So this is obviously where the breach was. They were going over where the hole was now. Huh? With midnight fast approaching, the teams in the office are frantically finishing the handover paperwork. With all the engineers finally off track and works complete, it's down to Supervisor Wayne Mace to give the all clear. Well, it comes the day before the rail line at Dawlish reopens. It's estimated more than £30 million was spent repairing the storm-damaged line. Well, we can go live to Dawlish now and to our reporter Scott Bingham, who's seeing the final preparations take place. Scott. Yes, Justin, it's been a real grey day here today, but despite that, there's a real sense of anticipation and excitement in the town. A volunteer group called the Friends of Dawlish have been adding a splash of colour with the bunting you may be able to see around me, and they've been putting plants in the station to all ahead of tomorrow's reopening to make it all look spick and span. But, of course, this is really about the engineering feat that's taking place here to get this line reopened and get the rail services in and out of the southwest back on track. Now, Network Rail say some days during the last two months there have been up to 400 staff working here. They say there have been times where it's been touch and go whether they're going to make this deadline, but it's all complete bar a few minor cosmetic touches. It's an ill wind that blows nobody any good, and even these ill winds were to bring benefits as the money for repairs flowed. The Orange Army has thronged Dawlish and Tynmouth for eight weeks. This local photographer was pressed into its ranks to do time lapses revealing progress on the controlled cliff erosion that was carried out. Three to four weeks of solid work every single day, about 12 hours a day here on site. Uh, multiple cameras here on site running 24 hours a day. And in addition to that, taking just general photographs that document what's going on as well. Accommodation had to be found for repair teams, including here near Dawlish Warren. They've been good as gold here. But obviously now we're coming up to Easter, we're having to ask them to leave now. But it has benefited us good throughout February and March. There's a forest of different contractors involved in this job as the logos on the sides of the vehicles demonstrate. Many of those obviously involved in the rail industry. Others are names familiar to us, but not necessarily through railways at all. But of course some people have been drawn to this area out of curiosity. What I would call disaster tourism, people coming to have a good look. Yes, they come along here, they come in and always ask where they can go to take a picture. The economic impact of the repairs has been felt widely. Plymouth's composite specialists, Pipex PX, were amongst the manufacturers called on to make components. Others have derived benefits that were less tangible. This remote-controlled aircraft expert was called in to give the engineers a bird's-eye view. For a self-confessed hobbyist, the Dawlish rail repair has been the challenge of a lifetime. Our local flying field, we fly around the fields and, you know, the fields start to look the same after a bit. So, like I say, to have something like this, it's fantastic, really. So you really are like a kid in a toy shop? Kid in a toy shop, that's right, yeah. No one can say with certainty how the costs and benefits balance out. If the reputation of the region itself really has been at stake, we may not know for years. Engineers at Dawlish have been working day and night to repair the most catastrophic damage in the network's history. But finally today, it's the morning of the grand reopening. And fledgling station manager Ian is master of ceremonies. Well, it's uh, quarter to six in the morning. I've been here for about 15 minutes and it's already incredibly busy. It's going to be uh, an amazing day.
The team are expecting none other than Prime Minister David Cameron to mark the occasion, so the stakes are high for a smooth morning service. At 5.55, the first passenger train in over two months pulls into the station. Bang on time. Welcome to Dawlish. Thank you. Welcome to Dawlish. Are you expecting this this morning? Thank you. <laughs> Good to be back on the train again. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Brilliant. I commute on a different line to work, but uh, this is the first journey, so I've come this one. I've had to go straight back on the next train, otherwise I'll be late for work. <laughs> and Sheila, a friend of Dawlish Station, has also arrived to be there for the big moment. Oh, 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 oh no! <laughs> Well, I'm going to pick them up because the station's clean. Just missed the first train. I haven't. You have, it's gone. No. Yep. I thought it was 6.31. No, 6.55. I The station looks absolutely fabulous. The best I've ever seen it, I think. It was a sad thing when it happened, but it's good to come out of it. Also smiling are passengers and staff who can travel the route once more. To have this back again is wonderful. Yeah, it's really nice to be back on, on track. <laughs> We've missed it. It's, it's been part of our entertainment for many years and we haven't been able to do it for two months. Very, very happy. <laughs> yeah. A lovely part of my life is back to normal. I think that's how most people feel in Dawlish. I've really missed it and I'm sure that all of our customers, because of course they've been on buses, and whilst they've been on buses, they haven't had this beautiful view. But it's wonderful to be back. And no one deserves to enjoy it more than the Orange Army, who, after 50 days and 50 nights of continuous toil, are arriving into the station ready for the big moment. It's now 9 o'clock. Um, my fourth hour and six minute at the station. Um, I'm starving. I've had about 15 cups of coffee. And, uh, yeah, so just getting ready for the main event, which is going to happen within the hour. The Mero Mares and Anne Marie, the MP, can stay on the platform. Okay. Everybody else off. We'll press everything off. Okay. Okay. Jimmy's going to be dispatching as usual yeah. from the front. So yeah, it's just keeping this part of the platform clear. With the last-minute checks in place, Ian is ready to greet the Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Just got one or two people to meet you, as you can right. see. Very good. Hi, Thank you. Hi. Thank you. A number of people here. A lot more than we expected. <laughs> but it's been on the media all day. It's a huge turnout. A countless number of people have arrived to witness this key moment in the Great Western's history. Prime Minister, honoured guests, welcome to Dawlish. On behalf of all the people, we're very, very pleased to see you. Thank you very much indeed. And this is a really important day for Dawlish. It's a really important day for the South West. I know how cut off people felt, and it was so important to get this work done. Is an enormous thank you to the people who have carried out this vital work. I know it's been an enormous team effort. We've had the Orange Army, let's hear it for them. Hip hip. Hip hip. Hip hip. Thank you very much indeed. That was very good, very exciting. What a nice man. <laughs> Yeah, well, 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 without a hitch. For each and every one involved, now it's time to heave a collective sigh of relief and enjoy the moment. Right now, it's a mixture of I'm proud, so proud of all the guys, um, relief, it's done, exhaustion. It's wonderful to hear and see the trains going through. It's, it's, you can't believe it's brought Dawlish back to life. The sight so many people have been waiting for as trains return to this line for the first time in two months. It's taken thousands of tonnes of concrete and steel and hundreds of rail engineers to get the route open, much to the relief of passengers. As we went through Dawlish with the bunting out, you know, it's the great British, great British uh, bulldog spirit, you know, won't be defeated by the elements. Welcome to Dawlish, a greeting which rail passengers have heard today for the first time since the beginning of February. Well, I was on this platform two months ago when it was strewn with debris, which was the platform and fencing from that side of the station, which had been ripped up and thrown over the tracks to this side of the station. Such was the sheer force of the storm. But today, much to the relief of the people in this town, the station is once again open for business. Well, the elements have regularly tested this route over the years, but the storm at the beginning of February finally won the battle 
But the sea wall gave way, leaving the southwest's main rail line hanging in mid-air like a rope bridge in an adventure playground. Network Rail promised to have the line reopened in six weeks, but within days there was another storm. The metal containers put in place to protect the site were squashed like tin cans. Engineers poured thousands and thousands of tonnes of concrete into the void. Meanwhile, further down the track, there was another hazard. The cliff face was in danger of subsiding and had to be deliberately brought down to make the area safe. Since then, Network Rail has worked around the clock to reconnect the line from Plymouth and Cornwall to the rest of the country. Well, today they delivered on that promise and the lines were handed back to the train operators, prompting a day of celebration here in Dorley. Well, the region down track west of here has been cut off from the main rail network since the beginning of February. But today, passengers in Cornwall and in Plymouth were able to board a train again all the way to London. And I joined some of those early morning commuters. Well, this is something rail passengers haven't been able to do in Plymouth for two months. Get on a train here that will go all the way to the capital. This is the 0553 to London, and I'm going to join commuters for part of the journey, at least, to Exeter. Well, here we are, dawn over Dawlish, that famous view that rail passengers haven't been able to see for a couple of months. The sea conditions are flat calm today. It's hard to imagine that that could have caused so much damage to this line. The journey's going well so far. I'm going to see what some of the other passengers make of it. It's a strange feeling. It's a strange feeling because I've been used to driving and suddenly we're back to normality, but I've forgotten what normality is. <laughs> How much disruption has it caused you over the last couple of months? It's been phenomenal, phenomenal. It added another three hours of travel time any time we want to do this journey. So it means you have a knock-on effect in catching flights. Uh, you have to put meetings back till afternoons, which means your day is either shorter or longer, or you have an extra day and you stay in London. So it is a big disruption. And going through Dawlish, what did that mean for you at that moment? Did you take much notice of it? I did, actually. It was quite emotional. You had all the people on the platform, so all are very proudly looking at the train going by. You think, my good heavens, this is the age of steam. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what, can I, what can I say? But it's good to be back up and running and you can see the staff are so pleased as well, you know, cheering from the bridge and as we went through Dawlish with the bunting out, you know, it's the great British, great British uh, bulldog spirit, you know, won't be defeated by the elements. And where yeah. are you heading today? Just into London, yeah. It's just a day visit there, isn't it? Yeah, it's just a day in London, yeah. OK, have a good journey. Thanks very much. Well, it's the end of the line for me, Exeter St David's, but this train now goes on to Taunton, Reading and then into the capital. Well, as we saw earlier in the programme, one of the trains arriving here today, and there have been many like this throughout the day, much to the delight of all the spectators here, but one of the trains arriving brought down the Prime Minister, and I asked David Cameron what he thought of the engineering work which has taken place here. Well, it's a very proud day and a great feat of engineering and hard work and community spirit that's got this done, not on time, but actually slightly before time. It's excellent news for the South West, good news for Dawlish, but good news for the whole country, because this is a vital part of our country and people did feel cut off. They're now reconnected with this uh, iconic railway line. This has been a vulnerable line for years. Why did it take a catastrophe, though, for it to be taken seriously, finally? Well, look, we obviously have done everything we can to get this line open, but we're now taking a serious study forward. The interim report will come in July, looking at alternatives and other things we can do. If there was a simple answer, it would have been come up with uh, years ago. There isn't a simple answer, but let's look at this study. But meanwhile, let's do everything to make this line as resilient as we can, and that work is ongoing. There will be a fear, I guess, that now the line is up and running, people like you will go away from here today and think the South West is fine, nothing more needs to be done. So you're, you're guaranteeing today that that study will be looked at, it won't be forgotten. Absolutely. Look, no one who saw that vast hole under the railway line and those railway tracks suspended in midair, that iconic picture of 2014, no one who saw that is going to forget this issue. So it remains front and centre, a real government priority to make sure we do everything we can to help this vital part of our country. Briefly. What the sea did to Dawlish seems unthinkable when you look at how things were before the storm. These stills by our cameraman Steve Briars were taken two days before the weather hit. It was at first light on the morning of Wednesday the 5th of February 
that Steve filmed what may go down as some of the Southwest's most memorable ever moving images. This was the main breach in the railway. 80 metres from end to end and three and a half metres or 11 feet deep, a dangerous place until the elements subsided. Next day, the rails were cut and engineers began improvising. The old track was laid along the exposed surface to hold it together. On top of it, they sprayed quick-setting concrete in layers. The first shipping containers were lifted onto the public walkway and filled with stone as a makeshift breakwater. Each of 11 rubble-filled containers weighed 50 tonnes. Around the same time, a scaffold was being built across the rear of the chasm. This let engineers move around safely and it supported essential communications cables. The bed of the railway had housed buried cables for purposes including international financial transactions. By the 12th of February this scaffold was nearing completion but the weather forecast was again indicating trouble. The second storm on February the 14th was also extremely violent. That night we sat back in the waiting room at the station and the whole station was shaking with the waves crashing in and uh, at that point we knew that we weren't sure what we'd come back out to the following morning. The length of the breach had grown by a quarter to a hundred metres but the scaffold held. They lengthened the breakwater and carried on to the next stage, pumping concrete into the hole as the foundation for the new railway. They couldn't use ordinary wooden shuttering to hold the setting concrete, so again they improvised and brought in concrete collision barriers from the road industry, building them up like a Lego wall to contain the concrete. These weigh three tonnes each, and they ended up as part of the final structure. By early March, they could bring in the final pre-cast concrete blocks which hold in place the ballast for the railway. It took more than a week to get these all down, and then they were secured with one final pour of concrete. Once the stone ballast that supports the track was in place towards the end of March, the rails finally went down. The main contractor says it's nothing if not solid. Without a doubt, the, the amount of concrete, both precast and, and, and wet mix, uh, that's gone in there, that will be there for another 200 years without a shadow of a doubt. Because that's what the South West wants to know. <laughs> That section. <laughs> I can't vouch for any other sections of the wall. But, but your bit's good. My bit's good, yeah. <laughs> the repair here was just part of the job. There were smaller breaches to plug, damage to the station, and a cliff fall to avert. Early April, and it's already been a year to remember. Neil Gallagher, BBC Spotlight, Dawlish. It was an extraordinary project, wasn't it? All making it possible for trains like this to come in and out of Dawlish once again. Well, the managing director of Network Rail for the Western Region is Patrick Hallgate. Earlier, I asked him to explain the scale of the work that's taken place here. In a variety of engineering work in many respects, from the sea um, wall collapse, obviously, that the most publicised part of it, you know, the 4,000 cubic metres of concrete that went into that, right through to the landslip, which is you know, 25 thousand tons of material that had to come down off the cliff face. That, both of those jobs in there on their own were huge engineering challenges. To have to do both of them at the same time was, was a challenge we've not faced for many a year. The rebuilt sections will presumably withstand a lot now, but this line is still only as strong as its weakest links. What more needs to be done here to future-proof this line? That's right. I mean, we saw the storms, you know, we know they were freak events, but as, as we know, the climate is changing. What we're doing now is we're, we're conducting a study that looks at um, the future proofing for Dawlish, from a Dawlish perspective, along seven miles of coastline to see what we can do to further add to the robustness and the resilience of this line. Is there much that can be done? What sort of options are being considered? We've broken it down to four sections of track because you've got um, a river erosion areas, you've got coastal erosion. The important thing we need to remember with this stretch of line is it does actually provide flood defences for seven and a half thousand homes. So it has got a future as far as network rail is concerned? It's absolutely got a future. It's a really important part um, of, the, of the town for Dawlish, but obviously a vital rail link to the southwest. Okay, and hand you back to Justin in Dawlish. Justin. Thank you very much indeed, Natalie. I can't quite describe the atmosphere here in Dawlish today. It's 
it's been a bit like a carnival at times with the bunting up here at the station and all over the town and flags flying everywhere. The station has been freshly painted. There's been a lot of tooting going on today as well, I can tell you. The flower boxes here, which have been planted up by volunteers, are looking fantastic. And I saw someone walking through the town with a sign earlier on today that said, we're back on track and we're chuffed. And I think that sums it up. And after all that the weather has thrown at this town after the last few months, would you believe on its big day, the sun has been shining. And what better advert is there for Dawlish than that view?